All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Camila Vitaitis, and I'm with the Colorado Conservatory for the Jazz Arts. We're a Denver-based organization, nonprofit, and we are focused on educating middle school through high school students about jazz. Um, but throughout the pandemic, we thought it would be a great idea to connect with, yeah, we wanted to connect with musicians around the country and around the world and kind of create a larger community. So we started this interview series and Colin Stranahan has been amazing in helping curate the series. Um, he's also a CCJ alum, so um, cool to have him in the family. Um, so tonight I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with amazing guitarist, Peter Bernstein. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thanks for having me. But to start things off, are you, you're in New York right now, Peter, is that right? Yes, I am. Yeah. How's everything going there? Well, it's a beautiful day today. Uh, it, it, it was raining earlier, so it was really quiet in the streets, but now it's just kind of like the sun came out at you know, seven o'clock at night, one of those kind of spring evenings. People are starting to come out a little bit and it, you know, it's, there's traffic again, so it feels like it's coming back a little bit. Have you been able to play a little bit? Some gigs, streaming gigs, and some, some little places are, are open for live gigs in the city. Uh, the Roxy Hotel has been opening. And then now they have a place, uh, second floor down is Django. That's so they have kind of two gigs going on at the same time, which is twice as many as most places have. So that kind of, that place is keeping some guys working. And Smalls is, and Mesro are open, so that's you know, those have been kind of some some of the staples of downtown for the you know the the uh, just the gigs. The, you know, the not not the Blue Note, not the you know not the big the big time thing, but it's like. That's, that's where the trenches, you know, where we where we live. Yeah. Those gigs are starting to open again, and uh, I heard 55 bars open. I haven't, but uh, so that's good. That's a good thing. And uh, yeah, the main thing is, you know, how much did people miss it? That's gonna, right. <laughs> that's going to be the thing to see. Yeah, and well, 2020, you did have you had an album release. What comes yeah. next? Oh, yes, I was lucky to uh, get a chance to record in June of last year. So that was kind of a bizarre experience. But uh, we were able to do a session and, you know, kind of a distance and also like this one can't take all night, fellas, like, like that kind of vibe it was like five hours. We really got to be out of there because that's kind of what they're a lot of time to, to have people. But it was really, you know, it was a we couldn't all be in the control room at once. We couldn't congregate in the ways that we used to at a recording session. So it was different and playing with masks. I mean, I think I don't think people have played except maybe a couple of times, if that, uh, when, when we did that date. I know I had done one gig or something, so I felt kind of, I felt really rusty, but we were able to, you know, get through the session and get through some original music, and then it came out in October, and then it was just like, wow, it's like I actually did something in this time when nothing's happening, so mm -hmm. that's a, that was a, you know, a bizarre feeling. Just like, you know, happy to just be be out here in, in this golden age of jazz you know it's just uh <laughs> making, <laughs> making our little statement yeah i noticed the other yeah. night well, well, no, i'm just feeling so, i felt so fortunate every time you get a chance to play and actually be around instruments like wow listen to that you know an mm -hmm. instrument in the room somebody hitting a drum it's not it's not the same as even you know watching our heroes on youtube it's just something about hearing instruments vibrate in a, in a room you know? yeah totally so. i realized the other night i was on a gig and like couldn't cue stuff because i because everyone i was try, trying to mouth something and everyone has their right. mouth it's, it's, it's all in the eyebrows now it's the only yeah. thing. <laughs> totally <laughs> i just you reminded me of this one thing uh that jimmy heath used to do when he wanted people to go to the bridge he would point to his the bridge the bridge you know he'd point to point to his teeth you know like <laughs> so it's kind of one of the little jimmy heath joke there but yeah that doesn't work anymore with the mask yeah. i figure the mask is hiding all these horrible faces that i make when i play so i'm I, you know i'm hoping it goes on for a long time that's Just... totally true <laughs> um well speaking of like the pandemic did you find that it affected your artistry in any positive ways did it give you some time to like listen or work on stuff you had been wanting to get to could you talk a little bit about that experience um well it, it did change things. I mean, not so, I mean, I have two young children and uh, 
we got a puppy too early on in the thing so that was I was busy with that and like basically I've done you know more dishes and walk you know pick, you know walk dogs and that that's what I've been doing mostly this last year but while uh, and, and like I was telling you before about this little space of my neighbors I've been able to just commandeer for a few months uh, keep my guitar here and have a little music cave uh, I've really enjoyed just uh, being able to play and not really have so much of an agenda of like I gotta get this together for this gig or I gotta work on this and you know which I love I love having things to do musically and when a gig did come in a couple weeks ago and my man Joe Farnsworth said learn all these cedar tunes because we're gonna play some of those I was like great I just learned all these cedar tunes I had kind of heard and I was so happy to have like some homework to sink my teeth into but to your question before that just just the time of of having like time to explore with my instrument and mess around with playing tunes and different keys and playing free and writing and all this and just all the stuff that you kind of want to get to sometimes but if you're if you're lucky enough to be busy with gigs you you focus on what you need to learn for for different gigs mm -hmm. which also involves a lot of let's see what do I want to play on this gig let me mess around with some tunes it's it's a lot of that anyway but but this time has definitely been uh, I think reflective and that that is positive you know if you want to be a get better at something you need both you need the community and you need the stimulation from outside but you also have to you know look look internally sometimes and, and get a balance of the two mm -hmm. so uh but generally in my lifestyle i found that i kind of had more time to just play the guitar when i was on the road <laughs> like if i was traveling and you get a couple hours in the hotel you know now I'll play, you know, take a walk for an hour and then play for an hour. But that's a solid, you know, a lot of times two things I don't get to do when I'm when I'm home taking care of whatever I need to take care of and, and teaching, which has been great to be able to you know be able to do that and keep in touch with people musically and you know like you, this is our community now and and it's actually much far reaching, more far reaching than it was. Technology yeah. is good in, in a certain way. Absolutely, it's been great. For Great for writing, great for just working on little things and trying to go down little rabbit holes musically and stuff. So. Could you talk a little bit about your writing process and what how composition usually takes shape for you? Uh, it's just kind of stumbling on something and uh, thinking about the craft of how to make it into something that's not just a, you know, uh, a sentence, but, you know, more of a story, something that unfolds and, and uh, I don't know. I, I enjoy the process of just kind of messing with things on the keyboard. I have a little Wurlitzer and I can mess with that. And then I go over to the guitar and that gives me some other ideas. Then I go back over to that and just kind of try a lot of things around a certain idea off of something and just throw things at the wall and see what sticks and just try to piece it together. Uh, really keeping in mind that if, if it's a tune I'm going to work on, which is always time well spent when you, even if you end up grappling with something and it, you can't put anything together. It's still a good a good time, uh, a way to use your time, I think, if you're really thinking about how things work. Sometimes it doesn't come together, and it just remains a fragment, which is okay. Uh, but when it does come together, it comes together in the way for me that I'm really thinking, like, is this gonna be something I'm gonna wanna play? And do I, how do I feel making some people that are like my friends, but you know, also they're like, I don't wanna waste their time. Are they gonna wanna play this tune? It's gonna be fun for them to play. So that, that's kind of a thing that guides me when I, in that process of composing, I want to write something that I'm going to want to play. Mm -hmm. And if it never gets to that place, it just remains like this little thing that I'm working on that maybe I can turn it into something that's a, that's a shape, that has a shape that, that people would, you know, that, that's fun to play with other people and see what they do. You know, so it's about writing something that has a personality but isn't so confining that it's not fun to, to play and night after night maybe if you're lucky enough to get a, a tour or a week someplace you know see if you can play this tune five times and and still not hate it that's that's mm -hmm. great that's a great feeling yeah well i always like to kind of ask how you first got started maybe like who you're what initially sparked your interest i think i read that you started on piano and then made the switch to guitar yeah like a lot of young kids in the 70s i was kind of uh into the entertainer everyone was playing the entertainer on the piano 
Uh, and I really got into the sound of ragtime music, like I was checking out Scott Joplin. This movie, The Sting, came out, and there were all these, the, the score, I remember my parents had the soundtrack, and there were all these rags on there. Some were orchestrated, some were just piano. And I loved the piano pieces and was like learning about Scott Joplin on my own in an encyclopedia, you know, just like checking him out. And, uh, and I wanted to play piano, so my parents, like, we got a little spin at piano, and uh, I got some lessons, and I just was enjoying it, enjoyed playing other, you know, pop tunes, and I remember kind of improvising on the piano a little bit, but then uh, when I was 13, I heard some, some kids at school, older kids at school, playing the guitar, playing a couple of guitars, they had electric, one guy had an SG, and they were jamming on something with a drummer, and I was like, that looks really cool, and I just got a, you know, an art teacher in my school at the time, assistant art teacher, who used to come and bring her guitar to the art class. And after we got into whatever we were doing, she'd play her guitar. And so she, I would talk to her about lessons, and she said she had a guitar for me. And uh, she sold me my first acoustic guitar and taught me some chords, and that was the guitar. And then when I got into, well, of course, I wanted to, you know, the sound was Jimi Hendrix and then blues, you know, that stuff. But, but first I heard Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin and the Yardbirds and Cream and all that stuff. And then you're hearing about their influences, so that took me back to the blues. And then just for playing guitar for a couple of years, hearing about different people. I was curious about Django Reinhardt and Wes Montgomery and who these people were. John McLaughlin, he sounds interesting. You know, just I was get some records of all these different people and got into jazz, got into Wes Montgomery and then just loved not just him, but the rhythm section, Wynton Kelly, there was the Smoking at the Half Note record. And it's like, oh, they're on a Miles Davis record, but I, I knew Miles Davis from that my first record of Miles I heard was Bitches Brew, still, you know, kind of that kind of, and it just took me back to Charlie Parker through Miles Davis, who's this guy that he played with, I better check out, and just the whole kind of little mini history of jazz, uh, I, was, I was just kind of diving into it through, you know, from the guitar, he wanted to know who these different jazz guitar players were, and then just getting into the, into the whole world of it, and that's it, I'm still there, I'm still looking for finding things that I haven't discovered yet so mm -hmm. but I always loved all kinds of music Class, some classical stuff but my parents had different things they had Beatles and Bob Dylan and Simon Garfunkel and I heard that stuff growing up they weren't too hip with the R&B they, they didn't really I don't know why they were just they didn't really know they have you know they think had one Marvin Gaye record I like that and they had a couple of jazz records but I just listened to all kinds of I remember my first thing I loved was the Jackson 5 and I had Jackson 5 greatest hits on a record and I would beg my mom to put that record on while I fell asleep so I could you know, hear at least the first side. Hope I fell asleep before the first side was over. So. And uh, that was just loving me excited by my music. So. Lucky that I can still indulge that, uh, you know, that uh, excitement. Do you remember what like made you realize you wanted to do it as your career or was it always, was it kind of just like the natural thing that happened. It, I mean, I was just getting really into jazz, and and I remember when I was about fifteen, I heard really we start checking out Wes Montgomery and Kenny Burrell, and Jim Hall, and then as I said, the whole the language, the horn players. I really I I got frustrated with the guitar. I think when I was a senior in high school, so I'd only been playing jazz for like a year and a half, and I was like, the guitar is not happening. I want to play the saxophone because I was listening to so much saxophone music, and and I just didn't. So I, I I'm glad I kind of didn't do that but I would that was really where my head was at just just checking out all that stuff and really getting into it and then when it came time to go to college I uh, just wanted to go be around other musicians I was looking around for different uh, programs and I didn't want to go to Berkeley necessarily because I was a New York City kid and that's far Boston was like another world so they had a couple of schools in New Jersey one was Rutgers and I, I went there for my freshman year uh, studied with Ted Dunbar, Kenny Barron was there. It was a great experience and, and just played with a lot of people and learned a lot about music. And I don't know if I had any feeling that I could, I was hoping maybe I could do it. I was just kind of so involved in it, I wasn't really thinking. I mean, college was the step, like, I'm serious about it. I remember having to convince my dad that music was something worth, worthwhile to study in, in college, which I wasn't necessarily convinced of myself, but that's what I wanted to do. So. Uh, with the help of my mother, who was an artist, uh, she was she was a sculptor, and she was more, well, less realistic, I would say, and uh, just just was you know helped me say yeah okay. And, and Rutgers was across the water there in uh, Jersey, and 
wasn't so far, so he could still see me. There were some things in it, and my dad was like, okay, that's what you want to study. He was just like, why study music in, in college? Why don't you go to college for something you could, you know, get a job? Rightfully so, worried about, you know, his son not starving, trying to play the guitar. Like, I was not a prodigy, or there was no, nothing he had, no reason to believe that. I mean, he knew I was serious, but he had no reason to believe I could make a living, so. I, I was just hoping to stay involved in music as long as I, as long as I could. And didn't have a career path or anything. I was just like, I gotta learn how to play. That was my, that was my goal. And that was, you know, but lucky that I, you know, got a chance. I know some kids that that their parents were dead set against them becoming musicians, and uh, some didn't, and some actually did anyway. You know, but it's. Uh, I just kind of eased into it when I got out of college or went to a couple of different colleges and was just playing with different people and got into gigs. And before I knew it, I could share an apartment. My rent was like 180 bucks a month and I could I could pay it doing some little gigs and teaching some lessons here and there. And it's like, I guess this is a living, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. I just said, not much has changed. I'm, I'm right. yeah. 20 years old. <laughs> I was going to ask you, as someone who has such like a distinctive voice on your instrument, what advice you have to young musicians about how to work on developing your own voice and taking from your influences, but not being like, not like making the transition from emulating them to kind of your own voice. Well, I think that's something that is always in process of, you know, you're always into trying to digest your influences and kind of, you know, purge the things that are just, you know, imitative and try to, you know, digest a language and then just try to express yourself. I mean, part of it is not even a musical thing, yet it's so wrapped up in, if you're, if you're lucky enough to play music seriously, it's so wrapped up in you know, your identity and do you have an, a, a, an original sound or something? It's like a thing to aspire to, uh, of course. But it's really a thing of just kind of having the courage of your convictions as a human being in, in a lot of ways. Now, I didn't, you know, I feel like I'm just starting to get that. And, and back when I would kind of beat myself up for not having the courage of my convictions more, I, I can't really fault myself because I didn't really earn it yet. You know what I mean? Like it takes a long time to kind of convince yourself why you should have self-confidence. It's like it's, it's not a bad thing because it does keep you getting better. It's like some people just decide to be confident. And then it's like, well, there's there's more to learn. You're still studying. So you're trying to balance that thing of being humble, you know, feeling like mastering an instrument, first of all, and mastering improvisation or just being able to be so in touch with your thoughts that you can, that you things just flow out of you. That's a mountainous, you know, thing in front of you. And you're always kind of like, oh, I think I'm getting a little ways up. And then you're like, no, I'm still, I'm still down. I'm still, still steep uphill feeling and and uh and that's okay i'm learning to accept that feeling and still embrace the, just the joy of being able to try and the joy of playing with people and the communal feeling of playing music and i focus more on that on the good things you know about playing that aren't like you know do i have an original sound or am i this enough or that enough because an original sound you know what is what is like it can be something that's just like a, you know, it, what does it mean? You have to, you know, figure out what's important to you musically and then work through those things to feel like, well, I'm here and I want to get to here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, I think it's, it's a very, there's a lot of things that make that path very counterintuitive where if you can stick to the intuitive part, it grows. It just like you grow as a human to the point where you just say, well, I'm, such and such years old and you know i'm still trying to learn but you know i'm getting more comfortable with myself and, mm -hmm. and trusting what i think and believing in what i think knowing that i can do that because i am trying to stay uh, curious and trying to trying to get better and still know that it's like it's not like i'm gonna arrive one day and say well that's it i have my own sound you're always trying to just work on those things that that give that to you and the more you can make it about the craft when it comes to the playing of the instrument and, and the more you can make it as 
something you want to aspire to as a person too and that will affect music and you know but I think for, for people who study music a lot of jazz education is geared towards teaching people stuff like concepts like things and everyone studies that same stuff and then they want to say like well how do I sound different but everyone's like studying the same stuff mm -hmm. I think counterintuitively or I may seem this way but the way to get to your own uh, voice in a way is through things that aren't as much like that and more about just your connection with your instrument and developing a personal touch of nuance and like it's just like a, an actor or a you know radio announcer they come into their voice they learn how to use their natural instrument and then enhance it and learn how to enunciate and all that stuff but they learn how to use their own instrument so your sound is something you're always messing with but I think it has to be uh, on the idea of like if I can just play a melody in a unique way then the things that make them playing a melody unique I can then try to absorb language and then study those concepts and that stuff that you're trying to learn but you're doing it you're trying to be original in just how you play anything mm -hmm. you know if that makes any sense you're trying to find originality in your touch on your instrument and your and just the sound of your of your cadence of your of your playing so you kind of work on being original by playing other people's melodies in a way like just mm -hmm. the standard melodies you know work on those melodies and try to play them in a way that's dealing with interpretation which is less about it's not at all about stuff and concepts that make you not just original but hip you know like so that's the whole thing people kind of dangle being original just like they dangle being hip in front of me like if I study these things I, I can be that but it's really more of a personal thing of connecting with how you make the instrument vibrate how you play one note I think mm -hmm. people will find themselves in in that kind of thing more if they, if they work on that more than if they well, I've mastered all the, you know, all the metric modulation and all the upper structure triads and all the double diminished scales. And I, I know this and I know that. Now, where do I do with it? Where do I put it? You know, and it's, it's, it's harder than, than trying to develop along the same lines, uh, just a touch on, on, on your instrument, how to play, how you speak. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like if you're playing honestly, your individual voice has no choice but to like emerge. True. Yeah. True. And maybe honestly, you're at a place where you're just checking out uh, somebody. You're just checking out George Benson and you're trying to play it. And that's if that's honest for you, then then be that and, and go do that all the way. And then realize like, well, that's George Benson stuff. At a certain time, I have to just say, well, how do I sound playing my own stuff, you know? And then you have to have the courage to say, I'm not gonna play George Manson stuff, even though it's way cooler and slicker than anything I will ever, well, welcome to the rest of the, like that's, nobody can. So that's where it comes into the courage of, the, of your conviction part about like saying, well, I'm gonna play my, I'm work on my stuff enough that I can stand behind. And of course it's gonna be influenced by this and that. And a lot of it is context. If you find yourself in this context, you might, associate with a certain player so you kind of go into that bag and I think that's just being aware of your surroundings at the same time you go too far you just you have your Benson bag for this when you play with this thing and you have your you know you have to try to find your way out of those things a little bit by just saying well even though they were they would do this I'm going to try to think of something else and, mm -hmm. and get understand that the game of trying to get a flow while playing with other people isn't just to regurgitate stuff even if it's referential stuff that everybody knows that that could be a, a, a quote it's like dropping a you know a reference in conversation you know you mm -hmm. quote something from some movie because it's appropriate at that time but you go on speaking with your own thoughts and your own in your own voice so a lot of it is just kind of saying well I, I have to purge the things where that I know I stole look at them why did you steal it in the first place dissect it absorb the music from it and part of your craft is learning how to make things out of things you have to be, make a lot of things out of something so if you steal one lick from george benson if you're approaching it in a creative way you will you will get 50 things mm -hmm. or you can get 50 things and and are they all completely original don't worry about that worry about variation and then you'll find 
you know, the way you vary things, the way you decide to, you know, project these phrases, that's where your own voice might come out, and those influences get assimilated. That, that's what it seems to me. I mean, I don't know. I watched someone like Barry Harris, so much a product of what he listened to, Bud Powell, Monk, Charlie Parker. But when you see Barry Harris play, it's not even bebop. You can't even say that's even a language. It's beyond language, because a language is something that, okay, we're speaking Polish now, and it, it's like, okay, what are you saying? That's the thing. Barry Harris, it's, it's just beyond, it's just like, Everything is just gesture. Everything is just like a, a a declaration, a statement. And it's like the style is almost invisible in a way because it seems like this, these these things he plays are just completely a part of his body, you know. But that takes years to do and a lot of focus too. So, you know, that's, that's the thing. It's, it's a long process, you know. So much good advice in there. And I love, you know, I think it's kind of a comfort that it's a lifelong process because, and the fact that you never arrive, you know, means that you're always doing the right thing by just continuing to work on it. Yeah. Yeah. But you also have to be honest with yourself. Part of getting, being a musician is the study of like your ears, right? You know, Mm -hmm. not just so you can transcribe solos really fast, but so that you can actually hear yourself and, and confront the reality of it. Like if you can really have your trust your ears and say, I'm listening to myself now, what do I want to improve? You know, and, and that's, that's part of it. Like, what do I want to sound like? You know, having some idea of it and you're chasing that, you know, but being honest with yourself, say, no, that is stolen. That's verbatim. That's this lick. So that's where you have to say, well, my ears aren't lying. That's stolen. So how do you, un- you know, steal it and then steal the idea? And then, you know, I think there's a quote from Dizzy Gillespie, you know, if, if you can hear it, you can have it, you know, that's something like that effect. And there might be something else after where it's like, you can't steal a gift, you know, in other words, he's saying, which is beautiful, which is like all musicians put their, put it out there, you know, it's, it's yours, yeah. you know, it's a gift. You can't steal it, you know, so, but, but the question is, uh, what do you do with it right. now that you hear it and you have it? What do you do with it? You just say, here's, this is such and such, this is so and so. If playing becomes just an agenda of things to, you know, hip references, hip quotes, yeah, but think of it, have your own thoughts sometimes too. Then the quotes uh, make sense and, and have an effect too. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. It, it's a, you talk about it forever. <laughs> um, well, maybe shifting gears a little bit, um, I wanted to ask you about, your long-standing trio with Larry Goldings and Bill Stewart, um, and what it's like to play with a band for that long, and what what you learn, what you've learned over the years, and maybe if you could talk about trio as a concept, like the challenges that come with trio playing, or how you're approaching that setting. Kind of a broad question, but no, it's. Uh, I mean, for well, first of all, all I would say, especially just you know people in jazz school and studying it's like put bands together now like get your find your musical friends and start playing with them and start trying to be around the people that make you excited to play even if they make you feel like you can't possibly hang on you know you're just going to get your ass kicked like be around those people that excite kick your ass in a, in a way that you're excited about it and want to you know uh want to want to hear it want to hear them play like that's what's important to find your, you know, your musical friends fast. And then, you know, time goes by and you can look back and say, wow, we've been playing together for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Then another, it's 15, now it's 20. Now, like, so they, if everything works out, you know, and you can, you can keep playing together. And that's a great thing to have, to have people that you played together with for a long time. Uh, We've been able to stay together because we don't own play together like I think if we were like a band a band that just that our musical life was the band we would have a some kind of life like a lot of bands do and then it's like all right they split for whatever reason it's very complicated it's a, it's a multi-tiered relationship on some level and then you have the external of are you able to work as a band we've been very lucky that we can always just kind of get enough gigs every year that we can you know we're still we're keeping it together and, and lately it's been more than it it was for 
a lot of years before that. And we always came together to do stuff, and it always, as the years went on, felt more and more like, this is so great. We get to play with other people and do other things, and then we get to do this again. That's like a reunion of, of, of old friends, people that you trust musically, but doesn't put you in a place, at least with those guys, does not put you in a place of comfort. It's in a place like, these cats have heard all my shit. I have to really, and I know they're gonna have some new shit for me, as they do every freaking night that we played together. You know, not that all gigs were great, but they always had some new shit ever since 1989. You know, so I'm like, wow, that's the ultimate, you know, challenge in a good way that I feel. To have that challenge with people that you feel comfortable with that are your friends is, is the best of both worlds because it really is like uh, a great thing of like, I want to, I want to just, you know, I feel free to like look for something and I should look for something because they know if you're not, just like you know if, if you know, and that's the beauty of it. We've been able to kind of keep a little chemistry together and sometimes it was Early on, it was Larry's gig, because then he got on Warner Brothers, and we got to record with him, so it was like Larry Golden's trio. Then I got some dates, and it was my, if, if I got the gig, it was my, I announced, and one time Bill got us a gig. He's got us a couple gigs, but one time he got us a gig at the Modern Drummer Festival, and that was Bill Stewart trio. And uh, so it didn't matter, though. We're like We just kind of played the tunes that everyone would call the tunes that we all were playing at the time, and basically had a consensus of, like, what do we enjoy playing these days, and what do we need to kind of replace or, you know, what else can we play or what, you know, what's, what's our agenda in terms of putting tunes out there, mixing it up with some new things and playing old things is a challenge because like I say, you, you want to come up with something different. You don't, you know, you want to make mistake going for something new. And, you know, it's, we played some of these tunes so long, there are mistakes, but basically it's like, it always kind of has its own little shape that it takes and let's mm -hmm. just look for some stuff and try to try to push and that the fact we've been playing it for 25 years or something is just in your head like come on man it's got to be better than that. <laughs> compare it to that if we, in our memory you know so that's that's the thing and, and those guys are just incredible uh, musicians and great people to be around on the road and just feel like I think over the years it's settled into a thing, thing of like yeah, this is this is kind of cool that we still have this and we can still do it and it's still fun so yeah. that's good. It's, it's a total blessing uh you asked about trio playing oh, like that's yeah. great it's a great thing just because of the odd number of peak it's a, it's a different blend and a different chemistry than a quartet certainly a quintet the quintet you have the front line and you have the rhythms like people kind of you know you have the infield and the out or whatever they people have their own positions but a trio is a little bit more uh, well, it's it's circular, so so it's and triangular, but uh, it's a, it's a, it's a cool thing, trios in, in general. Just the, the amount of, it's not a, it's not one on one, so there's like three relationships going on, which is which is cool, and the you know total one. But, so that's yeah. that's a good. I wanted to address that part of the question. Yeah, could you talk about like how maybe your role shifts between playing trio and then when more musicians are added like how does your mindset change or well it's just the context i mean the context can be created by the uh the instrumentation but mostly it's a it's a social experience that has to do with which people are right. playing and you know as you know you're you're a piano player right that's yeah. that's your okay um yeah, so it's just kind of what your role in the band in a way. Like, uh, of course, that changes as a guitar player. You can be like, like with an organ trio, you have that space to fill. With a quintet, with a horn and a piano, you can kind of be with the horn, or you can be in the rhythm section. You're kind of like, uh, but but it's. I mean, as a side man, I'm just looking for like, why why does this person want me to be on the gig? What am I supposed to do? Like, you know. Uh, what was my little little job to play? Mm -hmm. If it was a team, what's my position? You know, but um, it is it is more uh, about the the chemistry. And then of course, if it's like a my like my gig, then if I'm playing with a piano player, you know, piano, bass, and drums, then I get to feel like I'm more like the horn horn player out front, or mm -hmm. I you know, 
I want to be Betty Carter. I want to be that free of a, you know, of a, of a front person, you know. But uh, I just, it's a different, I get to just play, play the melodies and don't think about comping as much because most piano players don't need much comping if they're, you know, they have their own way. But I'll, I'll look for a place to do it and uh, comp for the bass and just, you know, it's just a different, you know, a different uh, conversation. But I love playing with piano players and I love, you know, I love comping too. I love playing mm -hmm. without them. But uh, it's just different contexts. And, you know, it's, it's funny, like, that's the fun, the fun thing about it. You want to take the same identity to every situation, yet be as attuned and aware of what you're supposed to be doing in this situation as possible so that you're you know, you're a good guest at someone else's uh, get, gathering you know it's, it's the leader's party they you know they're they're the host mm -hmm. so that's what I'm looking for how do I be a good guest how do I you know and if it's my party then I just kind of worry if everyone's having a good time that's, yeah. that's basically how it would be I haven't thrown many parties in my life but I'm sure that's that's the that's the feeling is everyone having a good time? That's you know. So I like I like that. I mean, I like trying to think about what I want to present as the leader and think less about is everyone having a good time. As I mean, enough to, so that they're okay. But I should be focusing because I really enjoy playing when I'm not the leader, so that I can play and have a good time. And right. just, listen, I'm not worried. I'm just I'm having a good time. That's my vibe to every leader that I play with. You know, and I, I, I realize it's, that's, I should have had this in front of my mind for many years. It's like, your vibe has to be to play as well as you can, but also tell the leader, like, I'm having a good time. I'm glad you invited me to this party. Because mm -hmm. that's, if everyone's putting that vibe out there, then there's a feeling of, yeah, let's do this. Mm -hmm. And if people are, for whatever reason, insecure, and I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing here, then it's a, it's a weight, you know, socially and kind of uh, chemically or, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, Chemistry wise, not chemically, but chemistry, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a, you want to be positive and, and have enthusiasm you know, and, and be into the music, whatever the, the tune, whatever the situation calls for, just be, be game to go, to go for it. Mm -hmm. And I realized looking over a lot of gigs I've been able, I, I was on and even recording sessions I was able to do, I was kind of more too much in my own head, not sure I was playing the right thing to, to be that as much of a good of a guest as I as I should have been. Mm. So I realize that's that's a big thing of it now. And any situation is about that. It's about the, the people. You know? mm -hmm. I guess to take this question like one step further, could you talk about how your mindset shifts when you're playing solo and how the responsibilities shift and what you're thinking about? Well, I've been trying to uh, think of this lately as not playing solo, but you're just alone with the tune. <laughs> and I never thought of that before when I was maybe doing more gigs when that I started doing that at Smalls in their early cocktail hour. It was a, it was just a thing of presenting the song. I re like that's what I realized, you know, early on. Like the more I was doing stuff that was just imagining a rhythm section and this is what I play, that that didn't work. I, I wanted to be kind of dealing with the song in, in in as much as possible. When I got away from that, that's when I started getting like well what am I actually doing up here I sh you know but it's just it's also a, a great uh, kind of a lesson for like dealing with your own sound the touch of your instrument there's not nothing else is heard except what you make mm -hmm. and and that just confronting that void and that silence is, is, is a terrifying thing and uh, it's just a question of how much you want to have worked out and how much you trust yourself to kind of go by the seat of your pants and just play through the songs and that it was really a lesson of like well how well do I know this song let me find out by playing it by myself in front of, in front of a few people and and uh, that was really a great uh, great lesson that way but what goes through my mind now and I really try to focus on that is just consciously be alone with the song you have the song there's so much there you know all I can do is mess it up you know the song is perfect by itself so if you can get the song to play itself uh, and it's still about the song, but it is about what you're doing to the song, especially if it's a song that everybody knows or it's like what you're doing to it. But I, I really feel like it's a way to connect deeper with the song, you know, mm -hmm. to play it by yourself and try to put that out of your mind that you're just, that you're alone. I kind mm -hmm. of just like, oh, I'll be playing with other people again eventually. So 
just try to enjoy this. What can you do by yourself that you can't do with other people? You can really deal with playing rubato and stating these these uh, you know these tunes, whatever they may be, standards, monk, whoever, your own song. You know, you have to confront your own song when you play it by yourself. What do I do? How do I put it out there? You know, presentation. You know, that's that's. Uh, but it makes me enjoy playing with people more. It makes me really appreciate that. You know. Yeah, especially after the last year of playing so much alone. Yeah. And I'm still like scared of solo. I'm working on it. Solo, <laughs> solo, right. solo piano. Well, that's, you have an orchestra there. I know, I'm just. And, uh, <laughs> guitar is like an orchestra. It's just like a really lame orchestra. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Thomas was asking, he'd be curious to hear your thoughts about being a good band leader and what that means. Uh, cool. Uh, well, that that is a uh, you know a serious responsibility in a way that that uh, it's the kind of thing that you you kind of grow the most in a certain way from from taking on that challenge. You know, I, I really think that people in these jazz schools should it should be like pop quizzes. You know, in regular school, like okay, every Friday night there's four bands and you find out on Tuesday who has to play, who has to put the band together. And everybody's got to scramble and put a band together and, and think, you know, 45 minutes set. Everyone's got to think about who do I call, what band do I want, who do I want, what personalities do I want to put together? What kind of party do I want to throw? Who should I invite? You know, what's the first thing that happens at the party? You know what I mean? What's the first tune? Who takes the first solo? When does, when do you, when does the drummer get, get a solo? How, how far into the set? All the things you want to think about, you know, uh, as, as, as the, you know, as the host of the party. Is everyone having a good time? It comes back to that. And how do you find ways to present yourself in the best light? You know, uh, as, a, as the leader of the band, you should try, I mean, I've learned this too over in, in you know, you have to like try to get the best guys to play with you, the best people to play with you, but it should be about you and, and the best and the best side people will be sensitive if you have a strong idea of, of and, and not like I've seen leaders just kind of let the band take over and that's also not good because you're you know it's it's your it's your time it's your 45 minutes it's your set what do you present what's the best way that what story do you want like so whatever you're working on whether it's you know rhythmic stuff or you're working on this music or that whatever you're working on you have to pull it together in some way and say what are you going to present how do I put my best foot forward first tune I have to cook on the first tune so you know play something that you're going to get get it get it started get the party started you know that that's the, that's the job of the leader so I've realized that that's what it's about over many years of watching other leaders do it well and less well and myself doing it less well and sometimes okay and then less well again and then like uh, you know how you know how much of your own m music do you want to play i always struggle with that i hate to make guys read and you know so I'll, I'll call guys that you know know more of my tunes because they know my tunes and mm -hmm. maybe you don't have to read them and they don't they, they don't mind playing them because they kind of know them already so that's a good thing then i feel less self-conscious about playing my own my own tunes and not things that people feel comfortable with except you have to balance like you know it is your thing put, mm -hmm. put you know do do your thing do you you know that's a really great that's great advice i needed to hear because i've been like leading some gigs lately and i think i do the thing where I'm like well what do you guys want to like try to leave it more up to them but I, it's a good reminder that if it's your thing I, i'll it. tell you as a side man i don't like when the leader asks me what i want to play yeah, you know, like, it, I mean, not. I mean, it depends, of course. If it's like a, I want to feature on something, then it's different. But it's like if they come to everybody, me, everyone. But what do you guys want to play? Like, it's your gig. You had all day to think about it. What do right. you want to play? Like, let's play what you want to play. Let's. What do you, it just makes it makes you feel like if the leader doesn't know what they want to play, then you know. But, but I understand the feeling of wanting to. You know, I'm also like. You know, what you, I want to make sure you're happy. You know, but it's right, a fine right. line of, of like, you know, they're happy to be there. They're happy to, that you call them for a gig. So, it's a lead. I mean, that's a hard thing. Leading is hard. It's not in everyone's 
personality, you know, necessarily. Mm-hmm. You know. And yeah. if it isn't your personality and you always want to lead, it's also good to like follow somebody else sometimes too. Like as a musician you really have to try to develop both both parts, you know, which is which is uh, a great challenge, you know. Because mm-hmm. every yeah. situation you're either a leader or the side man, you know, side person. So like that's it, you're one or the other, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great advice. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to ask if you've been working on any projects that we can like expect to see in the future, or if you have any dream projects that you've always wanted to do that might happen in the future. Wow. Um, well, my dreams have you know have definitely changed in the last year. Like just getting back to playing would be great. You know, <laughs> I'm not uh, very feeling very modest about it. Just getting, you know, getting back to it, getting back to playing and, and, you know, hope I haven't lost too much in this, in all this downtime. Um, but I don't know this, I mean, I don't know. I have this thing coming up in a couple of weeks where I'm going to, there's a series from Van Gelder Studios. That's a really nice thing there. They have this, you know, I assume very high end audio visual equipment. I mean, you know, the audio is going to be cool. It's Van Gelder studio. And, uh, it's a thing with Joey D. Francesco, kind of paying tribute to the organ music that was done at that studio. Uh, Billy Hart's playing drums, and Houston Person's playing a few tunes on on tenor. And I was just like very happy to get a gig. Like that's a nice that's a nice gig. It's to stream. It's a streaming gig, but at least you're playing in a place where you don't really need people because the Van Gelder Studio is like you just are in that space, and there's enough of a of a vibe. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, it's a recording studio. But it's not just any recording studio. It's like it's like a it's like a hallowed ground where the feeling of like man, so much stuff has gone down in this in this in these walls that it's just kind of a heightened feeling to be there. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, you know, actually, it's funny that 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 gig, of course, Van Gelder Studios is in New Jersey, and uh, I actually have another gig earlier that day in New Jersey at this great bass player Earl Sauls house he does this home concerts i did one back in the fall with tardo hammer a great piano player and this great guitar player rob reich uh so we're gonna do that that's like in the afternoon and then i can go up the street to van gelder studio so just feeling like i have two gigs in one day forget about the fact that it's, they're both in new jersey that's just kind of a that's bizarre but but uh two gigs in one day like that's that's just symbolically it's like they both work out you know i can this one ends, then I can get up the street to that gig, or you know, it's ten minutes away. It's like, wow, that's cool. That's that's a good sign. I've been, you know, had so many days where there's no gigs, and to have two gigs on one day, mm-hmm. but that'll be really fun. I think Rob wants to play all monk monk tunes, so we'll be playing two guitars, uh, and Earl on bass, and Andy Watson's gonna play drums. So those are my projects. That's actually, you know, if you live in that, uh, I think it's in. Does Earl live in Jersey? It's not far over the bridge. It's somewhere there. It's not Englewood Cliffs, but it's a little, I think, south of there. But look it up if you, you know, and if you're, if you live in New Jersey, look it up. You can come to Earl's, you know, beautiful garden, lawn. He sets up chairs and play music. That's cool. I have both best of both worlds. Yeah, that kind of segues nicely into another question from Matt, He's asking about your thoughts on Monk um, from anything. Um, from your relationship with his music to how you think about it on guitar, et cetera. Well, I mean, Monk has always been one of my heroes. When I first heard his music, it reminded me a bit of like Ragtime, the feeling. I remember hearing that tune, Light Blue. I'm like, wow, that's really got a feeling of it that's like, I, I related, right? And I also felt like Monk's music was so much like the sound of New York City that I felt like, you know, I connected with it as a, as a native New Yorker. But Monk, the way he approached the piano was like, I think, uh, it seems like he's just, in many cases, playing fewer notes than a lot of piano players would play. Because when you put your hands down, you have, you know, at least, at the most, five fingers on each hand. And lots of, you know, chords are big. And Monk was like, I want this note, and this note, and then this note up here. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to play this note down here a little bit louder than the one that's, you know, a second away, you know very specific ways of you know dealing with vibrations like making sound mm-hmm. and uh it was seemed to me like it was a reduction of the way a lot of piano conventionally piano players play it so as a guitar player you have to 
reduce. You have to adapt it and, and uh, take notes out. So I was like, Monk is taking some notes out. Maybe that's the thing. To do. Maybe even some guitar chords have too many notes in them. And it really got me thinking about space between the notes and just intervals in, in the sound of chords. And it, his sound got in my ear. And, and I just love his compositions. They're, each one is a you know, beautiful story. And, uh, you know, Monk has got it all. He's got, you know, courage and humor in perfect, perfect balance, you know. And swing. If you listen to him play solo piano, he's playing those like slow blues or those ballads. His time is just perfect. It's it's an incredible deep, deep rhythmic thing happening with Monk, uh, all the time, just in the placement of things, and uh, you know. So that's and, and as a guitar player, realizing that you know, so much of it is attitude, you know? but also specifically, he wants these tones to be ringing, and he wants them to be ringing in this way. So that's the, the influence. And playing some so playing solo, I was really trying to with a lot of monk tunes and see, you know, see what I can do with them. Um, another question in the chat um, is about transcribing chords by ear, asking if you have perfect pitch. Maybe if you could talk about how to develop your ear, how you worked on transcribing well, chords by ear. I don't have perfect pitch. I had to work on my ear ears a lot, and I still do I still try to make myself learn things off the rec I mean off uh, you know the recordings just like don't I mean my reading has suffered maybe as a result but uh, I try to keep my ears in shape because I when I was playing with people like Dr. Lonnie Smith or or I got to do a few record sessions with Melvin Ryan no music ever and Melvin Ryan would play like five original tunes we had to do a rehearsal the night before the gig and learn the music and then kind of remember most of it of course he would come back the next day for the session and try to change it and thank god kenny washington would not let him change it no melvin that was great it was it sounds good don't change it and i was like thanks thanks don't change it I, this is i kind of remember it from but we had to learn these songs by ear and and lonnie would just play stuff he'd say c minor like that's that's the hint that you get and then you have to put it together so i had situations where i had to use my ears and I'm, I'm learning to trust them more but it's not based on perfect pitch it's based on uh, you know just relative pitch and really based on like going back to the sounds and why some sounds are stick stick to you and why some sounds don't and I think a lot of the times when we're learning music that we think is complicated we use our brain instead of our ear which is this the sensory thing that we deal with with music so uh, that's the thing getting inside a sound is like really taking some time with it and trying to digest it. One thing every guitar player knows, thanks to Jimi Hendrix, is E7 sharp 9 in a certain voicing on the guitar because when they first learned that chord, it was like a, you know, one of those moments in life and it was probably the coolest thing that happened. I it was the coolest thing that happened to me in my life at that time except maybe like hitting a, you know, scoring a basket at the, at, you know, at the buzzer or something like that. That happened once, you know. So that was, you know, but except for something like that, like, and that's just like, so what? Because then you, you know, you miss your next five shots anyway. It doesn't matter, but you just got lucky. But this, playing this chord and really f letting it inside your being, like that's, everyone knows E7 sharp nine because they were open to the sens sensual experience of that chord. They experienced that chord and it, it's never gone. You know, so when we learn jazz, we're learning all these other sounds, and we're actually playing chords. We're playing chords we don't, we can't really hear. We're not, we haven't experienced them. So I'm keeping that in my mind all the time as I try to, you know, uh, in, in in teaching students, like trying to get them to think like hearing is important. It's not about how fast you get it; it's that you finally get it and that you learn to approach learning music with. It's all about getting as much of the nuances as possible and really experiencing the sounds of, of chords and, and voicings. I mean, it's, there's many ways to voice a chord, so it's not, it's just that particular voicing went into us, so we remember it. So how do we absorb all the other sounds and, and, and let them in too? So ear, it's just the study of being a musician is the study of ears, of your own ears, learning to trust them. I think otherwise you can kind of learn how to operate a machine just like you know you push a button on the coffee machine and 
but this is di this is different. This is like I, I push these buttons, but I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so because my ears are hearing what I'm doing, like that's the connection that we're all trying to make better. The more things that we fall back on that are mechanical, even if they sound good, you know, you have to. It's not just that they sound good. You have to know what you're what you're doing. I think so that you can see why it sounds good or why mm -hmm. it doesn't sound good and, and it's personal you know uh, and and very subjective but it, it's i think it's important to just keep your ear working all the time use it every day like a like a, like a muscle you have to use and don't just transcribe the same I'm doing 40 solos of the same player like, mm -hmm. use your ear to like do something different transcribe two bars of art tatum just get these two bars. It doesn't have to be a big run. Just what is this? If you, if you attack different things, I think your ear grows and you start to say, oh, wow. Listen to, listen to what the Ellington trombone section is doing. Wow, let's just try it. Wow, listen to that. You no. Know, remember Jim Hall had this thing he played with triads. And he's like, I hear the Ellington trombone section playing this. It's like there was another, he's hearing on the level beyond just the instrument he's playing and the notes that he's playing, he's hearing a sound, which is affecting his you know, the nuances in his touch I think so mm -hmm. it's hearing on a deep level this is such an amazing conversation like it's already been an hour I can't believe that oh, um, man. Jeez, that it's just like around. no it's amazing and yeah. there's so so much good advice coming my way today and I know all of us really appreciate it the last thing that I just like to ask I know we've kind of touched on it in a lot of ways throughout this conversation but do you have any advice for like a young, we're, we're a nonprofit that works with kids mainly. Like, do you have any advice for the young jazz musician about, you know, how to get into this and maybe something you remember hearing that helped you when you were young and learning? Well, certainly things like, like you're doing had to provide some kind of community for, for the music. I remember, you know, going to some, like, when I just started to learn some tunes. Like I went to this, uh, evening classes at the Manus College of Music. They had this jazz ensemble. It was just this guy playing vibraphone and he brought in charts and we just played. I could not follow a chart. I was just trying, you know, but I was, it was my first experience trying to play with people and, and follow the form and like listen to other musicians and personalities and just the whole, you know, communal thing of, of that's so important that you, that you don't just play along with backing tracks in your home and mm -hmm. you know get lessons from youtube and stuff it's like you have to interact with people and when this when it's really possible again i, I like I, like i said earlier i hope that you know people have missed these kinds of things you know these kinds of of communal thing where you're in a room with other people and you you know you have to get along you have to share the space mm -hmm. the sonic space and the you know chemistry space all that you have to just you know it's so important so I mean I think for young musicians just to find friends even if it's just one person your neighbor play you know you have to play with people and uh, I mean I, I, I was thinking like they're talking about you know this the budget you know plan the stimulus and more money's gonna go to schools and more money's gonna go to schools for music it's like that's great I, I'm happy to hear that it should just be a, just a start like, what if we lived in a society where actually not just kids were told to play music, but uh, people of all ages were like, you should do a thing where you play music with people. It's like, you, you go to church, that's part of community too. And church where there's music, those people like, you know, they connect with music in that, in that way. But I mean, in a deeper way where someone learns to play an instrument and play it with other people. like. If there was a society that exalted that as a thing to do, I think it would be a better world. Like, cause, cause you learn so much about how to, cause you have to have your part together. You have to know what you're supposed to do, but then there's also other sounds you have to, it's, it's a metaphor for like living with others and balancing your personal ego. I wanna be heard. I wanna have a solo or what all those things. And then the ego thing that's where you're like, man, we sound great. Our section, when we sing this part, you know, like that feeling too. You, you, you need to do both. And and playing music requires both things of you. So I, I really think it's like, it's such an important thing to do. Now, there's a little bit of holding theory in saying, well, if, if that's true, then why are musicians so crazy? Like, how come musicians aren't more well-balanced people? Like, what's, but I really think there's like, I mean, I, I can't, 
can't have no I have no comeback for that but but I think it's like musicians do something and instead of it like not that you know it has to be exalted in it, but it has to be looked at as a thing that's a positive thing that people do they play sports together that's the way they connect they go to you know there's church there's there's or any kind of organized religion people have all kinds of ways of feeling community but if you do it when you play an instrument with other people you're you're being challenged on, on both sides of that you're not just, just just be be one of the followers it's not that it's more of like you have to have you're an individual and you can have a sound and you can have a, a strong part in this music if your sound is developed but you can't develop it unless you have an awareness of how to blend your sound with other it's just like i don't know it's a hope for for uh, humanity because we're not going in that direction and technology takes us even further away on some level too but it, it's uh it's got to there's got to be a push back to that and music that's what music does so people have to try to find as many you know situations to play you know mm -hmm. and make them good you know make them positive and fun you know it's hard but Wow, this has been so inspiring. Thank you so much. I I really appreciate you taking the time. Yes. Um, I know it means a lot to our community. Thanks for indulging my uh, my yammering. Yeah, right. And Peter, thank you so much for this great conversation. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right. It. See you guys next week. Thanks. Have a good one, everyone. Bye.